Okay, um, so this is going to be a quick uh, example and unfortunately not a very uh, happy forward-looking example, but um, this is the reality. So what I decided to do for this case study was to go back um, and um, go back to where I did my PhD, go back uh, um, s in terms of uh, visiting the literature and seeing what has been happening since I finished my PhD uh, in this area. So I did, part of my PhD was done in this uh, beautiful region of uh, southeastern Peru uh, in the uh, province of Madre de Dios. Okay, so what's uh, s a few statistics or generalities about this, this uh, province? Uh, first, the location, of course, but then um, the size of it and the uh, uh, population density. As you can see, it's not very densely populated. Uh, also very interesting, uh, about 3% of the people living in Madre de Dios are uh, indigenous, and they are um, either organized in communities uh, there are ethnic, uh, different, uh, eight different ethnic groups organized in uh, uh, native communities, but there is also a number of indigenous people, uh, a number of uh, ethnic groups that are uh, in uh, Spanish called non-contactados or uncontacted by the, um, let's say, um, more Western uh, civilization. So this is pretty, uh, Peru is very proud of having indigenous people who are um, living the way they lived all their uh, lives and this uh, whenever the um, uh, airplanes serving the region uh, come across uh, uh, a view of indigenous people they get very excited and you know there are uh, pictures in the news uh, and one of these was uh, was circulated when I was uh, doing field work there anyway so um, from a conservation standpoint, uh, what is uh, interesting about this region or important about this, uh, this province is that is, uh, it is um, covered, maybe half of it is covered by uh, potentially very, uh, in very good condition forests. So in 1997 there was a, a study that identified frontier forests or forests that have had uh, uh, least impact, um, human impact or anthropogenic impact. So this is uh, again a very important region of uh, uh, southeastern Peru. Now in terms of um, multi-use, uh, landscape uses, uh, there are multiple uses in, uh, uh, in, uh, in this province. This is a map that was generated by WWF and it has a lot of information and I actually cropped the map. The map had a, uh, covered the broader region and I cro uh, cropped it only to Madre de Dios. But what we can see are, uh, first of all, in the uh, light green, we see natural, uh, uh, natural protected areas. So you see a lot of green. A lot of this, the, this state, this province, is uh, protected uh, uh, via, well, there are three national parks and then other uh, natural areas that are protected. Then darker uh, green represent um, reserves that are set aside for indigenous people. So we see uh, one here and the border of, uh, of a couple other um, reserves for uh, indigenous people. Then uh, in red over here, what you see is a uh, conservation um, concession. So the government uh, has leased uh, this piece of land for various conservation projects. Uh, sort of uh, pilot studies and and testing grounds for uh, for conservation initiatives, and this this conservation um, corridor or conservation concession is uh, sa sandwiched in between uh, timber concessions. So um, other types of uh, of land use in um, uh, in this province, and then over here in this area in the um, uh, this kind of brown uh, area. Uh, are other types of, of forest uses by, by local people, uh, not necessarily uh, indigenous people, but just uh, uh, local uh, Peruvians. And also uh, some small parts uh, here you see in purple, uh, forest concessions for um, Brazilian nut, um, um, I guess, um, extraction of, of natural resources. So Brazilian nut is a very important source of income for local communities and they, uh, they uh, obtain these uh, concessions, forest concessions from the uh, government to uh, earn money and uh, make a living in this area. So again a lot of, a lot of um, um, 
land use and a lot of um, um, concessions made by the government for, dif uh, for different purposes. Then, not, not to forget uh, biodiversity. This is a biodiversity rich area. Um, recent studies published in the last 10 years or so uh, did various types of inventories, and I'm just mentioning a few here. Uh, 41, 41 uh, species of large mammals, uh, over 1,003 species, and I'm talking only about this, uh, this province, uh, Madre de Dios. And then over 600 uh, bird species, 114 amphibians, and we can go on and on and on. It's a highly, the point I'm trying to make is it is a highly uh, diverse uh, region. So this is where I did my dissertation work. I was very uh, fortunate and excited to be uh, to, to work at this end of the, uh, this conservation concession. Uh, and I joined a team, a uh, strong and large team of uh, conservation scientists uh, uh, um, that were um, supported by World Wildlife Fund. Um, and my part was um, actually well, doing some field work here uh, with, uh, with a conservation biologist I highly uh, praise and respect, uh, George Powell from, from WWF and with uh, botanists, Peruvian botanists. Uh, it was a great experience for me. But the reason I was there was to try to um, remotely identify, so using satellite images, uh, try to first identify large canopy uh, species, tree species, that are uh, used as uh, resources, as I mentioned, I think yesterday I mentioned this, used as resource, food uh, source for, uh, by um, animals that we are, um, we are trying to uh, uh, conserve or preserve or protect. And so uh, my, my uh, field work was basically going and finding those trees and, and uh, mapping those trees and then um, using th this lo the tree locations in conjunction with uh, high spectral resolution uh, satellite imagery to uh, characterize the signal or the amount of light reflected by uh, these trees um, through remote sensing techniques. So that was my, my dissertation, part of my dissertation, about two chapters if I remember well. Um, uh, but while I was there, um, you know, I, I was observing different um, uh, types of um, natural resource uh, use um, uh, in the region. One of them was gold mining and I wasn't I wasn't at all familiar with this process before going to Peru. Um, and so we would see these uh, little, um, I don't know, shacks or establishments along the river. Um, and wha what these were, I thought initially, I thought they were just people living uh, by the river. But uh, then I got, ex uh, somebody explained to me, no, this is actually uh, um, gold mining. Use, uh, extracting gold from the uh, uh, sand, uh, river sand, or actually the soil, the um, river bank. Um, so that was one, and I, we, we saw uh, quite a bunch of these. Uh, and then another, another uh, development uh, while I was there, uh, or later on uh, when I was uh, finishing my PhD, was the building of this uh, Interoceanica Highway, or um, I guess uh, inter, Interoceanic uh, Highway, I guess you would be in English. Uh, this idea uh, being uh, to connect Peru with Brazil from the Pacific coast all the way to the Atlantic uh, coast of, of, the, of South America. So Brazil has a, a very good um, uh, uh, highway system, but that uh, stopped uh, somewhere uh, at the border with, uh, with Peru. And uh, eventually there was uh, enough um, uh, support and I guess enough funding to uh, extend the highway finishing here, extend it all the way to, uh, to, um, to the coast of, uh, to the Pacific coast of uh, Peru. So when I was, I think the last time, my last field season, uh, I would go to Puerto Maldonado and then by uh, boat about six or seven hours go up the river. And the last time I went to Puerto Maldonado, I wasn't sure what was going on because this used to be a small town um, not a lot of um, activity, and all of a sudden it was booming with activity. There, it was really hard to find a room at this small hotel, the only uh, hotel available in town. And I would see a lot of people in, 
uh, business suits and wondering what was going on. And then somebody told me, oh, well, they are planning uh, the uh, continuation, the extension of, of this highway. So um, now it's open. You can uh, go from the border of Brazil to Puerto Maldonado to Cusco. This is going up in altitude over the Andes and then down again to the, uh, to the coast. So that's done. And of course, that uh, raises the question, with, with this highway, uh, are we going to see side roads developing? Are we going to see deforestation occurring uh, because of opening of this um, uh, very easy to travel um, uh, road? Okay, so my last trip down there was in 2008. Um, so I decided uh, to um, give you an update. There are many updates. The, the, uh, this region, because of the uh, uh, multi-use landscapes. Uh, this region is, uh, has very complex issues and there are many, many facets that we can talk about. But uh, I decided to uh, talk about the probably the most difficult part and the most depressing part, <laughs> which is the gold mining. Okay, so uh, in 2012, um, this, uh, this news or this, um, yes, this news piece came out in Nature uh, and it, um, it providing a, an overview of what was going on, what is going on in uh, Madre de Dios uh, in regards to uh, uh, gold mining. So the title is Peru Battles the Gold Cur Curse of Madre de Dios. And why is this a curse? Um, well, it is a curse because it's, uh, it's growing exponentially and extremely um, uh, at, an, at an alarming rate. Um, just to give you some statistics, um, as of 2012, and this is you know not updated anymore. It's not a, an, a, a very good estimate anymore. But uh, around 2012, there were an estimated of um, uh, 30,000 uh, small-scale uh, miners, meaning like you saw in that picture, uh, a family or a single person uh, working, uh, trying to extract the uh, the gold. Amazing profits anywhere at, at least 70 to 600 dollars a day it almost makes us want to go there and try to get that much money or maybe not so it is a huge profit for um i think we went out of power um I, uh, it's a huge profit for um for the the miners um attempting to do this um the the problem besides the fact that uh, this requires, um, well, this uh, creates a lot of um, disturbance. One of the, the biggest problems, should I stop until, uh, oh, okay. One of the biggest problems is that uh, this is, um, as I said, artisanal or, or um, maybe I should say uh, classic basic extraction of gold. Um, which means it's done via the use of liquid mercury. So mercury is an extremely toxic uh, substance, as you all, I'm sure, are familiar with. Um, and the way the, the miners extract the gold is through uh, mixing the, the sand and water with uh, liquid m uh, mercury, beating that with their bare feet in a barrel. Uh, then uh, the mercury, what the mercury does is it... Uh, um, it um, congeals around gold. So what then they have to do is pretty much fry that, heat up that, that uh, nugget of mercury and gold to separate the mercury from gold. And then there is a lot of uh, dumping in the river of everything else that, is, that, really remai that remains uh, from this process. So it's a highly toxic, highly invasive way of uh, extracting uh, gold from, from, these, uh, from this region. And this is an estimated um, amount of, um, of mercury that is used per year in Madre de Dios, uh, 45 to uh, 50 metric tons of mercury. Um, a bit of, to put this in, the, in context, in a global context, Peru is a number six in globally in terms of, of gold uh, production. So it's a, a major player um, on the global market. And about, it's estimated that about 20% of this mining is, da is done illegally. Now, what, what does this mean? For the government, it means that they don't get the taxes, so they don't get the revenue. Uh, locally, what it means is that there is no regulation, uh, there is no control, uh, so illegal uh, mining occurs uh, anywhere it can uh, occur. Um, 
And there is no, because it's illegal, uh, this adds to the uh, 40 to 50 uh, metric tons, estimated metric tons that go into Madre de Dios. So uh, a very, very uh, serious concern to have about, about the environmental uh, damage or uh, destruction that is occurring there. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, mercury is actually mostly uh, banned or un um, has been um, removed from the gold mining process in general. Big corporations don't, uh, don't, use, gold uh, don't use mercury anymore because it is so toxic. Uh, yet Peru is still allowing the use of mercury and is actually importing, allowing mercury, not allowing, um, um, importing mercury to support and, and feed this, uh, this uh, gold mining, this extraction uh, throughout the country in general. Okay, so no wonder that uh, this, this publication, this news, um, also um, was uh, raising you know, serious issues about what's going on there, uh, including the uh, deforestation that is associated with, uh, with gold uh, mining. Uh, and the deforestation occurs because, of, uh, because um, uh, miners need to access the uh, river banks and they, um, they basically cut down the forest to get to the soil. Uh, another thing to consider is that it doesn't happen only along the rivers, it happens uh, also along the tribute, not only uh, along the big rivers, but also al along the tributaries or along those um, stretches of, the ri uh, of rivers that have been closed, separated from the main uh, river by um, uh, seasonal processes. So those are um, so-called um, inner lakes or colpas in, in Spanish, and those are more forested and uh, deforestation occurs uh, there as well. So this, uh, this, uh, deforest this uh, alarming news about deforestation was based on a study that was published in 2011 in PLOS 1, and this study looked at just two uh, mining regions, uh, heavily used uh, regions for, for gold mining, and what they did is they took uh, satellite images from 2003 all the way to 2009. Uh, and so we have the two sites, uh, sorry, yes, two sites, this one and this one from 2003 to 2009. So we have the first image and the last image of that time series for those two sites. So what, what these uh, researchers did uh, was to uh, quantify forest loss associated with uh, mining. Uh, so this is start point 2003, this is end point 2009, this is one of the sites. We don't see any kind of deforestation occurring along this river. This is the end of it, 2009, uh, nine deforestation. Uh, we see bare ground um, um, due to uh, clearing of the forest for uh, gold extraction. This, the other site over here, uh, similarly, we have uh, the major, uh, a major uh, tributary here, and then we have smaller rivers uh, or streams occurring over here. And this is before or with minor uh, mining uh, activities, and this is in 2009. So it is based on this study. Uh, the uh, research community started to get uh, very worried because of uh, the alarming rates of deforestation um, associated with uh, gold mining. Another uh, uh, piece of information that this, this paper provided was um, uh, by, uh, throughout the years, uh, the mining area, how, um, how it increased um, and a correlation with uh, the price of gold and the mercury import. So what we see is that the three are uh, highly correlated. We import more uh, mercury uh, to sustain more uh, mining and we have higher uh, um, mining activities and deforestation occurring uh, because of that. Now, in, at the broader region, so that was, um, this study looked at uh, just two sites over here. A third site, they didn't, uh, there were some issues with the third site and they end up uh, not using it in the main analysis. But this study looked at just two sites. They also, I forgot to mention, because they were looking at rates of uh, deforestation, they also uh, selected as control regions, selected uh, sites um, along highways and roads, uh, well, along the highway, the only highway, and side roads, uh, and quantified deforestation. So they had kind of a, the background deforestation rate 
in general, where there, there, are, uh, there is human activity but no gold mining, and then deforestation rate at these two sites that are heavily used for, uh, for mining. And that's, when, that's why they, they could say that by comparison, uh, in areas where mining occurs, deforestation rates are much, much higher. But then uh, a study published uh, just two years later, published in 2003, did an analysis of the whole region. And this is, this is even more concerning. Um, so what we see here is um, mining in purple, uh, mining that occurred before uh, 1999, and then all the way to 2012, uh, uh, increased mining activity. So we see some, pur we see a, a big uh, purple uh, patch here, but what we also see are different other colors, not purple, meaning that mining ha uh, has increased, the mining activities have increased throughout this, uh, throughout this region. And mind you, we are, uh, here is uh, Tambopata, uh, over here uh, Manu National Park, so there are, uh, Manu National Park is the largest park in, uh, in Peru. Uh, Tambopata has its own uh, diversity and, and uh, um, endemic species to protect. So this is really uh, bordering uh, uh, very important um, uh, areas uh, set aside for conservation. So this was um, mining activity um, identified through uh, satellite image classification. The same group uh, looked at uh, deforestation rates or deforestation occurring in, in the same region. So again, this is 2008-2009, uh, the, um, let's say the um, comparison, point of comparison, and then 2012. And we see a lot of uh, red, perp uh, orange and red occurring. So we have increased activity, uh, dramatically uh, increased activity, uh, mining activity, and then uh, increased deforestation in the region. Um, what has the government done so far? Um, the government has passed a regulation that uh, limits the uh, legal mining to this corridor. Um, and unfortunately, the area that I studied is somewhere in here. But anyway, so this is a large chunk that the government has decided to uh, set aside or provide for, for mining. Um, and then um, uh, within this corridor, we have mining allowed with permission from native communities because, as I showed, there are uh, indi indigenous people uh, living in communities and in, uh, in their own reserves. So that's what the government is trying to do. What in order for in order for this to be functional, uh, all miners have to register and receive a permit. And this is where the bottleneck uh, starts or shows up. Uh, it takes about a year, uh, estimated year for the for a miner to go from application to being granted a permit to extract uh, gold. So that is a, a huge. Uh, problem with this with this approach that uh, um, it will take way too long and I don't think the miners will uh, wait for a year given that they can make anywhere between 60 70 uh, dollars a day all the way to 600 dollars a day so uh, a year of waiting is a major major um, monetary loss and also I should mention that this has drawn not necessarily this but the mining activity in general has drawn a lot of a lot of uh, individuals from outside this this um, this particular region. So, because it's so profitable, people from anywhere uh, in Peru or Bolivia, uh, neighboring countries, Brazil, are flocking in here to um, to get you know the profit. So it's not just for the local communities. Bilal is not here. Uh, it's not just for the local communities. So looking forward, I don't know what to tell you, except that uh, first, uh, if the government finds a better way of, of um, providing a uh, faster way of providing permits, maybe that will help uh, slow down the, um, the illegal mining. Uh, also, maybe the price of gold, if it drops again, <laughs> it will uh, make it l uh, less profitable of an activity. But as you can see from 2008, 2009 is where I finished, I finished my PhD, but that that's when the uh, price of gold just skyrocketed and that, um, that fueled the uh, increased interest and the uh, unfortunate um, environmental degradation associated with uh, mining. And that's all I have. I don't have a positive message. Sorry about that. Question, why you choose this piece of Peru? 
why did I choose this region of Peru? Um, I chose this region of Peru because I met uh, George Powell at a conference, at a conservation biology conference, and we were talking about remote sensing of forests, and he had this ongoing project, and that's how I ended up so in southeastern Peru. It was enthusiastic for you. It was, uh, it was an opportunity that, that uh, was uh, presented, and I uh, took. And George is living in America? I'm sorry? George oh. is living in America? George? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I think so. He was in Thailand, in Thailand. for a while, yeah. so I don't know <laughs> at okay. this point. Yes, uh, I guess I have to take a walk. <laughs> That's as far as I can come. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think we have similar problem like this in Sapo National Park. So the park has a buffer area of three kilometers. So there are people who are actively mining in the park. But then the major challenge is you have two government agencies. One is responsible for the management of the park, mm -hmm. and the other one is responsible for issuance of license for mining. Mm -hmm. So in my, from my experience, you'll find people who have mining license and mining in the buffer of the park where they shouldn't be mining, mm -hmm. and also you ask them and argue that, yeah, we have license. So the park managers find it difficult to remove them because they have license. Mm -hmm. So from this study, I don't know whether you have any experience with such problems and how they manage to. Yeah, th this is uh, a very good point. And this is a problem in, um, well, in Peru in general, that there are different a agencies, like you said, providing different types of of uh, yes. permitting, they have to get permits from different agencies. And they get conflicting, uh, that the agencies are conflicting each other in their decisions. So there is a, a permit for um, logging, for example, but not a permit from the indigenous community or from the uh, park uh, service. And yes, there, there is no good cooperation and communication between agencies. And it would be much better to have a unified permitting system I, to which all agencies participate instead of having separate agencies that basically contradict each other and then yes it's it's even harder to to make these activities completely legal and controlled yeah so it's not yeah it, it seems to be a problem one yes. last question yes From yeah uh, you at the first instant you mentioned that you used hyperspectral yes uh, imagery, mm -hmm. and finally you presented as uh, the amount of land use change or land cover change, mm -hmm. which can be done from other satellite images and hyperspectral yes. images. So, what images, softwares, and uh, methods mm -hmm. do you use to arrive at such? Okay. So uh, to clarify, the first part that I showed it hyper hyperspectral imagery was part was my uh, part of what I did my work. The second part that that analyzed uh, development of mining and deforestation was done by another group. I was not part of it. So they used um, uh, Landsat imagery, and they used uh, a classification algorithm called CLASS C L A S S. And that class algorithm has been, uh, was developed by Asner. So if you want to learn more about that algorithm, uh, you can check that paper. They explain uh, a little bit about that algorithm. It's an algorithm that was published several years ago, uh, developed by, by the Asner group, and has been used in several publications now. Okay. Uh, what yes. was accurate, the level of accuracy? I don't know the le the uh, misclassification. I don't know what was the misclassification, but I'm sure that paper has the details. And we'll make a copy. Yes, and I'll have yeah. I'll provide a copy. Yeah. Should I stop? We should probably. Stop.